John Schneider has developed a reputation for throwing curveballs during NFL Draft Weekend. Which wild cards could he shock the world picking with pick number 16 in the first round? I'll be diving in here on a Blue Friday edition of Locked On Seahawks. You are Locked On Seahawks, your daily Seattle Seahawks podcast. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Greetings 12. This is Corbett Smith, host of the Locked On Seahawks podcast, your daily Seahawks podcast, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Special thanks to all the 12s out there, whether you're listening in Hawaii or you're tuning in from St. Petersburg, Florida. We greatly appreciate each and every one of you for making Locked On Seahawks your first listed five days a week, six days away now from the 2024 NFL draft and be taking a look at some first round wild cards that John Schneider could shock fans selecting plus your Monday mailbag moving to Friday we'll have a blue Friday edition of a mailbag and I'll be diving into day two and day three tight end prospects that could interest the Seahawks this episode brought your way by our friends at Monopoly Go I admit it I have a competitive side I'm a big fan of Monopoly Go the mobile hit twist on classic Monopoly join your friends and download Monopoly Go now for free on the App Store or Google Play. Now for your lead story here on our Blue Friday edition of Locked On Seahawks. During his previous 14 years at the helm during draft season, John Schneider's been known to throw a few unexpected wrinkles in when nobody was expecting them to happen. We've seen first-round picks such as Rashad Penny, LJ Collier, a number of selections made over the years that nobody could have anticipated coming And going into this year's draft, the Seahawks don't have a top five pick like they did last year. It felt like there was a little bit more clarity on what type of player the Seahawks would be trying to draft there. They ended up picking Devin Witherspoon, who was considered a blue chip talent in the top five. But being at number 16 and not having a second round pick, there's a lot of speculation Seattle could trade down at least once to recoup picks, if not a second time, as Schneider's done before. Regardless of where Seattle ends up picking in the first round, though, everybody's looking at guards. They're looking at centers. They're looking at pass rushers, linebackers, maybe if you trade down a couple times. Those are viewed as positions of need. But John Schneider likes to pick the best player available. And keeping that in mind, everybody's got to be expecting that curveball here with a player that maybe nobody thought was going to be picked by the Seahawks, whether at number 16 or later in the first round after a trade down. As far as players that would be a surprise. This first one that I'm going to throw out as a wild card, I'm just going to say it right now. If he is there at number 16 and the Seahawks end up taking Brock Bowers, the tight end out of Georgia, I don't know that I would consider this necessarily a wild card. Me personally, I know a lot of people would be surprised, but this is a guy that has an incredible amount of talent. You look at the numbers he put up at Georgia in three seasons, 175 receptions, 2,538 yards, 26 touchdowns. He also ran the ball into the end zone for five touchdowns. How many times do you see a 230 plus pound tight end utilized in the run game? The Bulldogs did that with Brock Bowers. And oh, by the way, he's also a really darn good blocker. Georgia's had some great running teams the last few years, two national titles in that span with Brock Bowers helping spearhead that run game. So even though he's not the biggest tight end, He plays with physicality. He's a solid blocker. You can move him around the formation. Clearly can play out of the slot. He can play H back. Uh, This is a rare tight end in today's game that I think warrants a top 10 or top 15 pick. But if he somehow is there for the Seahawks at number 16, then I could absolutely see Seattle go that route. Because aside from Noah Fant, they lost Will Disley. They lost Colby Parkinson. Their number two tight end right now is Farrell Brown, who's not known for being very involved in the passing game. He's over 30 years old and mostly been a run blocker. He's on a one-year deal. Brady Russell and Tyler Mabry, the other two tight ends on the roster. This is a position where they could really use a game changer. You put Brock Bowers with DK Metcalf, Tyler Lockett and company, that I think this could be a really fine addition for Seattle to go in Ryan Grubb's offense. On the offensive line, there's been all the talk about guards. You've got players like Graham Barton. You've got Jackson Powers Johnson. There are players like Troy Fotanu from Washington that could slide inside at the next level. But what if the Seahawks drafted a tackle, just a pure tackle, and maybe consider moving Abraham Lucas inside? I've talked about before why I don't necessarily think that that is a plausible idea. And at the same time, 
if Seattle wants to go that route, this is one of the best tackle classes that I've ever seen. Amarius Mims from Georgia being the first name that I want to break down here. He allowed one pressure all last year. Now, he did miss a big chunk of games in the middle with an injury. There have been some durability question marks, but he's 6'7", 340-plus pounds. He has been an outstanding pass protector throughout his time at Georgia. He has the ability to get after in the run game. I think he is better in the pass protection department, but he is not a slouch in the run game either. Clearly a first round caliber talent that still has a very high ceiling with some of those injuries limiting how much he was on the field. And you look away from Amarius Mims. You don't have to go far in the SEC for another player that I could see the Seahawks falling in love with that I expect to be a tackle only in the league. And coming from Alabama, that is J.C. Latham. Last year, the number's not as good as some of the other tackles that are expected to go in the first round. He gave him a couple sacks. 14 pressures, though, for a full season in the SEC is pretty darn good and only giving up three quarterback hits. And what I like about Latham, those of you watching on YouTube, you can see the tree trunks, the stumps that this guy has for legs. He has incredible drive power in the run game. He's been really rock solid in pass protection. Latham is a player that could instantly bolster Seattle's run game. He's got some tenacity, some physicality to him, a really powerful blocker. So Seattle's looking for somebody that can slide in at right tackle on day one, and they can move Lucas inside if they wanted to. Again, I think both these players, Mims as well as Latham, are tackles at the next level, but if they wanted to move Lucas and see if that experiment can work, then I could see Seattle maybe surprising some people and picking a tackle with their first round selection. Now, as far as the real wild cards, I've talked up Cooper Dijon from Iowa. I don't consider him to be a wild card because a lot of teams are viewing him as a safety. And I think that is a big area of concern for the Seahawks, at least beyond 2024. And it's an important position to Mike McDonald's defense. But if you're looking for the real wild cards, positions that – nobody would be expecting would be drafted in the first round. Look no further than the receiver position. Jackson Smith and Jigba selected last year in the first round with one of Seattle's two first round selections. They've got DK Metcalf, Tyler Lockett's coming back, Jake Bow. I mean, this is a really deep receiving core. So why draft a receiver early? Well, if LSU's Brian Thomas Jr. at 6'5", 200 pounds, kind of a tall, lean, vertical running machine, if he is there, at pick number 16 or after a trade down, Tyler Lockett could be gone after this year. He might retire. Maybe the Seahawks decide to move on. He's got a huge cap hit with that restructured contract. And of course, there's always going to be murmurs about what's next with DK Metcalf. I don't think he's going anywhere, but the Seahawks are a organization. They like to look ahead at positions. And if Brian Thomas Jr. is there, especially after a trade down, this guy had 17 touchdowns last year. And yet he was kind of stuck in the shadows of Malik Neighbors, who's probably going to be a top five or six pick in this draft. There are some scouts out there that think Brian Thomas Jr. might actually have the higher ceiling of the two players. If you can get him in the first round for his best player available, they're not going to be moving on from Tyler Lockett yet. But this is going to be an offense with Ryan Grubb where there's going to be a lot more four receiver sets and less two and three tight end sets. So having four dominant receivers would make sense. You put Brian Thomas Jr. in this group. I know it's the rich getting richer, but you are also looking towards the future. So I don't think it's going to happen, but that would be one that if it did happen on draft, they'd be like, well, this is John Schneider. And you look at the needs beyond 2024, you can maybe make a case for it. And the last player on here, I mentioned Cooper DeJean, who I think is a safety at the next level. There's another player in the first round discussion who I could see potentially making that move that maybe would be more inclined to stay at corner. Seattle drafted Devin Witherspoon last year. They've got Reek Woolen, so a cornerback might not seem at the top of the needs. But Terion Arnold coming from Alabama, he is not the biggest guy. He's around six foot and 190 pounds, but he plays bigger than that. He's one of those physical, hard-hitting guys, and he had over 200 snaps in the slot last year for Alabama. He picked off five passes. He had 13 pass breakups on top of that. So this guy has ball skills for days. I don't think he's quite on the same level as Cooper DeJean in that regard, but I think that Terion uh, Arnold has a chance to be one of those weapons where you can move him all over the field. He played some of that star position at Alabama, and Nick Saban has talked this kid up. Watching the film, I think he is definitely a top 20 talent in this draft. And because he has played a lot of snaps in the slot, 
He had a sack last year. He can blitz. He has played a little bit of free safety. I can see this being a guy, though, that could make that transition. He's played a fair amount in the box. There's already that built-in versatility playing in SEC competition. So I know that fans would scoff at the idea Seattle would draft a corner, but this wouldn't be quite the same player as Cooper DeGene, but it would also be a player that certainly has the versatility and the skill set to be able to play multiple positions in the league. And Seattle's defense, maybe he does have that well-rounded skill set to potentially be a safety. So Arnold is another wild card to keep an eye on potentially for Seattle with their first round pick. Up next, I'm going to tackle your mailbag questions. We've had to push it off to Friday with all of the pre-draft buzz, but I'm going to be answering as many of your questions as I can coming up next year on our Blue Friday edition of Locked On Seahawks. This episode is brought your way by Yahoo Finance. Let's get straight to the point. You want to grow your portfolio to deal with the rising cost of inflation. You want to pay off your debt or your mortgage. Pretty much anything standing in your way and financial freedom, right? With Yahoo Finance, you can reach what you want to do as far as news, data, and tools to get that financial freedom. For more than 25 years, Yahoo Finance has been the brand behind every great investor. They're number one in finance destination, producing a holistic look at the financial news cycle, including breaking news, original editorial perspectives, analyst ratings, independent research, customizable charts, and so much more. Securely link your brokerage accounts for a unified view of your wealth, including 401k and other investments. A comprehensive perspective is what sets apart great investors, and it's how Yahoo Finance Finance ensures you have the insight to look at your wealth in its entirety with a community of over 90 million users each month. Their real strength is helping you on your way to financial success. For comp uh, comprehensive financial news and analysis, visit the brand behind every great investor, yahoofinance.com, the number one financial destination, yahoofinance.com. That's yahoofinance.com. You're listening to the Blue Friday edition of Locked on Seahawks. I'm your host, Corbin Smith. A special thanks to all the 12s that are tuning in and making Locked on Seahawks your first listen five days a week. We greatly appreciate it. Don't forget to check out on the Locked on Seahawks page as well as Locked on Sports today. You can see the entire first round of our 2024 Locked On Podcast Network Mock Draft, and you can see my selection at number 16 overall. That pick is available on our channel. You can listen to all 32 picks with analysis from scouts, in-depth experts, and a number of other people on the show. It is a fantastic production. Make sure to listen into all 32 picks that's on Locked On Sports Today, or you can listen to the Seahawks pick and a few other picks around number 16 on the Locked On Seahawks channel. Let's get to our weekly mailbag. Didn't get to do it on Monday, and we had to push it to Friday because there's so much going on with the draft being just around the corner, but we've got tons of questions from you our valued listener. Let's get to them. Our first one here coming from Seahawks RFA on X. Would Seattle have interest trading a future second round pick to move back into the 50s for a player like Junior Colson? So this is why the draft process is always fluid. And John Schneider's talked about this before. Last year, that for this year, the trade of the Broncos getting a third rounder moving back to the fourth round, getting a future third rounder, because he said this year's class was expected to be deeper in his estimation. And yet here we are, and I can tell you that there are some depth concerns, and I think the NIL, the COVID rules, all those things have played into it. Guys are staying in college longer because they're getting paid more money. So the depth is not quite where I think John Schneider expected it was going to be. But if they view this class as better than next year's and there is a player like a junior Colson that Mike McDonald badly wants, we've seen John Schneider give up future picks before. I don't know that he would give up a future second, but if there's a player he really wants there, they don't have a second round pick right now. If they can't recoup one trading down, then that certainly is a possibility. And Colson would be one of those guys. I think that's the sweet spot where you would try to trade to be able to get him. Our next question coming from Robert Vino, 1211. Not trying to trade Tyler Lockett, but obviously it's best to be prepared for life when he decides to hang it up. Do you think Malik Washington, Jacob Cowing, Malachi Corley, or a different receiver in this class could best fill the role he currently plays? So as I mentioned in the first segment, you know, Brian Thomas Jr., he is more of an outside receiver, but the point is taken with your question that sometimes you want to be preparing a couple years ahead in the draft. And so maybe Seattle would invest an early pick, but I think that the sweet spot to get a receiver for Seattle, maybe the third round, if somebody like Malachi Corley is on their radar, 
He is as good creating after the catch as any receiver in college football and in this draft class. So if you're wanting a tough-minded guy like that that's got some kick and punt return experience, then maybe Corley is a player they would look at as early as pick number 81 if he slips into day three, absolutely in play in the fourth round. Honestly, though, the player that I've watched at the position where I expect Seattle to draft that I think would be the most natural fit to bring in and replace Tyler Lockett and kind of have the same trajectory where he could return kicks to start off as well is Jaquan Jackson from Tulane. Never had a thousand yard season with the green wave, but he averaged over 16 yards per catch in his college career, scored a bunch of touchdowns, an electric kick and punt return. And it feels like in an offense, it's going to be airing it out a little more that he has a ceiling that's higher than where he's going to get drafted at. I think middle of day three, that Jackson is a guy that would make a lot of sense. He's also built fairly similar to Tyler Lockett. So I think this is a deep enough receiver class that you can get some guys like that. You know, maybe somebody like Taj Washington as well coming from USC because of his speed ability to take the top off of defense. I see some similarities in his game to Tyler Lockett. But Jackson is somebody when I watched him instantly, I thought, maybe a poor man's version of Tyler Lockett that you can develop and he can be a pretty solid NFL receiver and kick return specialist in Seattle. Our next question coming from J. Cole 206. What is the potential draft mood the Seahawks could make within reason that would shock you the most? It would be if they pick somebody like Bo Nix in the first round. That would be the most shocking thing for me at this point. Not picking a receiver, not picking a corner to move to safety, uh, not picking a linebacker if you trade down a couple times. The biggest surprise would be if Seattle, after trading for Sam Howell, decided in the first round, I wouldn't be surprised with Michael Penix, but if it was somebody like Bo Nix and they ended up drafting him in the first round, that would be a jaw dropper even for John Schneider. So that would be the move that would really surprise me if they made it. This next question, probably my favorite one in today's mailbag from ZF2917, top five running backs, to watch all time. Well, number one is really easy. Anyone that's listened to this podcast regularly, even though we are not a Detroit Lions podcast, Barry Sanders was the player that made me love football. I mean, this was must-see TV. If the Detroit Lions were on, I grew up in Indiana, so the Lions were on quite a bit because it was close by. But if the Detroit Lions were playing, my mom would shout, hey, Barry's on TV, and it wouldn't matter where it was at in the house, I would sprint because he just was a human highlight reel. We will never see another Barry Sanders with his juking ability, the underrated power. This guy was not just out there making people miss with jukes and spin moves. Obviously, he was as good as anybody ever with that, but he also ran with some power when he needed to and just – uh, just a guy that made defenders look silly, like no running back in NFL history. Number two on my list, I was torn on this one because LaDainian Tomlinson is another modern back that put up ungodly numbers and his ability to catch the football really made him a ton of fun to watch. And the, the number of thousand yard seasons, I just don't know that we're going to see running backs anymore in today's climate like that. But Walter Payton, I didn't get to see play live, but I've got to have Walter Payton on this list because going back and watching Bears games, Sweetness had such a crafty running style. He could throw touchdowns. He could catch touchdowns. He could bust over people with truck sticks. He could outrun guys. He was one of the most complete players that you're ever going to imagine at any position. So it would be Walter Payton, LaDainian Tomlinson, and then rounding things out, this is not because I'm doing a Seahawks podcast. Marshawn Lynch, just some of the signature plays and just the brutality that he ran with is unprecedented, at least in the last 25 years. And the impressive runs like the Beast Quake, the second one in Arizona, I mean, he's got to be on this list. And I actually have a fullback at number five. Mike Allstott, they don't make him like this anymore. If you watch the Tampa Bay Buccaneers back in the day, Mike Allstott ran the ball a lot as a fullback. And you want to talk about a guy that defenders made business decisions on. Nobody wanted to come up and try to tackle a 250-pound battering ram. And Allstott had surprising speed, hit on some big runs in his career, also was a reliable blocker and a pass catcher. I had a blast watching Mike Allstott during his NFL career. So I know he's a fullback, but he was one of my favorite players ever running the football to watch play on Sundays. Our next question here coming from Ryan B. Katz. 
What are the chances Jake Bobo ever converts to a pseudo tight end role? Seems like he has the frame if he bulked up and the dude is so nasty as a blocker. I'm going to say it's less than 5% because I, I understand the idea that he is a really good blocking wide receiver. He's already tall, but he's barely over 210 pounds. Like we're talking bulking a guy that already is not fast, bulking him up to 240 pounds, 235, 240 to be a tight end. So while I understand the idea, I just think that it's impractical. I don't think any way it's going to happen. So I'd say less than 5%. Our next question here coming from Matthias Arnett. What would be a pick at 16 that would make you feel like the Seahawks are taking a backward step towards the future? Well, to be honest, this is such the draft is such a crapshoot. There's not a player that I can look at that's expected first round pick and say, oh, that's going to send him backwards. You know, you could scoff at the idea of bringing another corner or drafting a quarterback if it's not the right guy. I mean, there are positions you could look at and say, I feel like you could maximize this pick more. What would be the issue is if this ended up being something like with LJ Collier, where Collier was viewed by most people as a third round pick and the Seahawks reached taking him. So if there's a position that gets picked down in the first 15 selections and Seattle goes into a panic mode and they end up investing a first round pick on a guy that's clearly a day two or early day three talent, that would be the pick that would be the bad one. You want to get the best player you can get if you can check off needs while doing that, that's a perfect scenario, but you don't want to reach and, and panic because there's a position you need. And wait, the guys that are first round caliber aren't here anymore. Then don't take a guy that's a day two or day three prospect in that spot. Our last question coming from Doug in 54 on threads. If you were a billionaire, well, I kind of wish that was, and could buy, relocate an NFL team, which one would you buy and where would you move them? What would be the team name? Well, this is a lot for me impromptu to do here, but look, and I had a picture of Paul Allen up here in the graphic, um, an incredible man, uh, rest in peace. Uh, he's sorely missed. But if I could be like a Paul Allen and I could save a franchise, you know, I don't think that the Los Angeles Chargers are in trouble because they get to play in that new stadium. But I mean, they don't have a fan base that's dedicated in Los Angeles. And the Chargers have a pretty storied history with some really great players in the Hall of Fame. So I would say let's get rid of that second team in Los Angeles. And I know that the practical thing would be to bring it back to San Diego. But for the fun of this activity, let's go to a city that hasn't had an NFL team in the past. And for me, I would take that Chargers team and I would go up to Canada. I would bring the NFL to Canada and, you know, maybe that ends up being Vancouver. I know they've got a lot of Seahawks fans already there in Vancouver, or maybe you end up relocating the Chargers into the middle of the country. But I would strongly consider going to Canada if you're looking in the United States as far as cities I'd like to see St. Louis have a team again, potentially move them there. Team names depend where they're at. If you want to have a lot of fun, why not go to Anchorage and you, know, you could have the Anchorage Polar Bears or something like that and put them into the NFL. That'd be a fun team to actually have in one of the Western divisions. Up next, I'm going to get away from the goofiness of relocating a franchise, and we are going to talk tight ends, day two and day three players who could be on Seattle's radar as I mentioned with Brock Bowers. This is a position that is an area of need for the Seahawks this year and in the future, which players from the second round on could be potential targets for the Seahawks. I'll get to that here in a moment on our Blue Friday edition of Locked On Seahawks. This episode is brought to you away by Monopoly Go. Guys, I need you to all listen up for this huge announcement. I have been tracking the leaderboards every day, keeping my eye on scores, putting all my heart into it, and I'm super pumped to announce I'm finally on top. That's right. Obviously, I'm talking about the hit mobile game, Monopoly Go. You've probably heard of it. It's been downloaded over 150 million times. It's a great mobile twist on the classic Monopoly game. You can play it anywhere, anytime. Explore hundreds of Monopoly boards from Las Vegas to Camelot and my favorite, The Moon, all while raking in a huge fortune. You can charge rent on iconic park, uh, properties just like the classic Monopoly. You can charge your friend's rent on your iconic properties or go after their Monopoly money by pulling bank heists and taking wrecking balls to their landmarks. But maybe my favorite part is the leaderboards where you can see a Monopoly tycoon and who's gone bankrupt. So get yourself all the charts, download Monopoly Go now for free on the App Store and on Google Play. 
You're listening to the Blue Friday edition of Locked On Seahawks. This is your host, Corbin Smith. A special thanks to all the 12s out there. Greatly appreciate you making Locked On Seahawks your first listen five days a week. Heading towards next week's draft, we're six days away from the start of the first round in Detroit. The Seahawks have a number of positions of need, and one that I don't think is getting talked about quite as much as maybe it should be is the tight end position. As I disclosed earlier with Brock Bowers, he is clearly head and shoulders above every other tight end prospect in this draft class. But Noah Fant is the only returning tight end that started games the last couple of years. You've got Tyler Mabry, who's mostly been a practice squad guy. Brady Russell, who was a special teamer after being undrafted out of Colorado last year. And Fair Brown, he has been a serviceable rotational blocker. And so this is a team that has some questions this year and certainly after 2024 at the tight end spot. Luckily, I like this tight end class a lot. I think that there's really good value to be had on day two as well as day three. Let's look at the guys in the second and third round, really that number 81 overall selection where the Seahawks could maybe look to get a tight end if obviously they don't draft Brock Bowers early. As far as day two guys, the first one I have on my list, Ben Sinnott to me is head and shoulders above the rest of these players as the clear number two tight end in this class. He's rugged. He is a very well-rounded player, and he tested a lot better than I anticipated he was going to. Not a guy that's going to generate a lot of big plays, at least at Kansas State he didn't, but with the athleticism he displayed at the Combine, there may be some untapped ability to stretch the field in the passing game. He certainly can move the chains, and he is a nasty blocker. He's got that mentality to play in line. You can move him around. So Ben Sinnott would be the number two tight end for me on my board. Then you've got Cade Stover coming out of Ohio State who played linebacker when he first joined the Buckeyes and last year eclipsed 500 receiving yards. He's had five touchdowns each each of the past two seasons. He has developed into a pretty solid receiving tight end. And at over 250 pounds, I do think there is room for him to develop into at least an adequate run blocker that can play some snaps in line. He is not there yet, though. So there'd be some projection here. But if you're looking for a guy that could instantly make an impact as a receiver, and he's got the mentality to be able to block, he just needs to grow into that position, kind of like Colby Parkinson ended up doing in Seattle, that I think that Cade Stover would be a player to watch. At Texas, Jatavian Sanders, this was a player that we were talking up as a second-round pick, and then he had a really rough Uh, workout at the NFL combine didn't test well at his pro day either at least in in regard to expectations but Sanders is a guy a couple years ago had five touchdowns he's caught a bunch of passes the last two seasons for the Longhorns he has been a guy that can get some chunk plays in the passing game and he's an underrated blocker there's a mentality there he's a guy that was able to anchor Texas run game a little bit so while the testing has not been where people thought it was going to be I still think that Jatavian Sanders here's his name on day two, probably in the third round now, because there's enough really good film on a solid all-around player, and I think there's plenty of room for him to grow as well coming into the league. The last guy that I've got a day two grade on, I know that a lot of the mock draft simulators have him in the day three ranks, fourth and fifth round, but Theo Johnson out of Penn State, you can't teach a 260-pound tight end to be able to run in the four fives and put up the testing numbers he did. And oh, by the way, he's a good football player over 340 receiving yards and seven touchdowns last season for Penn State. Surprisingly, block part of his flashes, I think getting him into an NFL weight room and getting him some more coaching on technique that he can be a really solid blocker at the next level. So Johnson's a guy I have a third round grade on that the Seahawks had in for a top 30. Those four players all could make sense for the Seahawks on day two. Now, shifting the attention to day three, again, I think that this is a draft class. Maybe it's not the deepest tight end group we've seen, but it's a pretty deep class. I think there's a number of guys that could be potential starters at the tight end position on day three. I'm going to start off with Jared Wiley from TCU. He's a player that has been quietly moving up boards. He's 6'6", 249 pounds. He ran a 4'6'2" forty yard dash and he also had some other really good testing numbers. I have major questions about him as a blocker, but this is a guy that undoubtedly has the ability to take a top off a of defense. He's a major matchup problem with his size. Maybe he could be a Colby Parkinson 2.0 where you just get him into an NFL training camp and you get him into the weight room and he could develop into a decent blocker to go with his obvious mismatch and receiving skills. 
And Jaheim Bell from Florida State, he is the second guy on day three for me. The Seahawks met with him in the combine. Very rare combination. He played running back at South Carolina previously. He returned kicks and then transitioned to tight end. So there's clearly going to be after the catch ability with that running back and kick returner background. He's made some improvements as a blocker, more of a shot, uh, a short squatty build than some of the other tight ends in this class, but you could move him around. He is a true move tight end that's got some H back capabilities and the special teams prowess as well. So Bell would be a player on day three, maybe in that late fourth, early fifth, that I think would make a lot of sense for the Seahawks. That would be a fun fit in Ryan Grubb's offense. The next two players on this list coming from the Big Ten, Eric All is a much different player than, say, a Jared Wiley who had a breakout year catching the football. Eric All tore his ACL last year. He also had a season he ended the season with a back injury. Durability has been a huge problem, but when he has been healthy, you can see the field stretching capabilities. This is a guy that can absolutely win down the stretch. He can get some separation against linebackers and even some bigger slot corners, safeties. And there is some ability to create after the catch. He just hasn't been able to stay healthy long enough. And he's a better blocker than advertised. He played for Michigan and Iowa to run heavy teams in the Big Ten. So you better be able to block. There's a lot to love about the football player. If he didn't have the injury history, I might have him on day two but he's clearly a day three prospect. Staying in the Big Ten, Tip Ryman does not have very much production as a receiver. Illinois did not use him much in the passing game, but when you turn on the tape, you can see the potential, and at 271 pounds, he put up some ridiculous numbers, including a 7.02 second three cone. That is elite speed for any tight end, especially one that weighs over 270 pounds. This guy's got all the athletic chops, and there's enough good tape on him to suggest that he could be a much better NFL player than he was a college player where Illinois didn't throw the ball much to begin with. They didn't utilize him. He is just on the tip of the spear. Tip Ryman has a lot of upside as a day three pick that I think could make sense for the Seattle Seahawks. And capping off my day three players, Dallin Holker from Colorado State, he previously played for BYU and then transferred before last season, had a breakout year with 767 receiving yards, six touchdowns. His blocking can be hit and miss. He's more quick than fast. He didn't have a great 40-yard dash time, but he ran a 6.83 second three cone. That's faster than a lot of receivers run in that drill. So his change of direction skills are elite for a tight end. I think as far as move tight ends go, that this is a guy in the middle of day three that has a chance to potentially play a big role early in the NFL. And my last tight end here, totally different than all the other ones I've mentioned. Most of the players I've talked about, they have receiving backgrounds. A.J. Barner at Michigan and Indiana before that, 64 career receptions. He is not going to light it up in the passing game. He's fairly reliable, but not a guy that's going to be stretching the field, isn't going to be commanding very many targets, but playing for Michigan where they had the number one rushing attack in the country last year, this guy is a mauler. He has an attitude. He plays with physicality. He's just a little over 250 pounds, but you'd think he weighs 270 the way that he plays the game. So if Seattle wants to bring in somebody that's going to replace Will Disley from the standpoint of being a guy that can really get after the run game and is at his best as an inline tight end, then I think A.J. Barner would make a lot of sense. And obviously Mike McDonald would have a little bit of familiarity with him because he played in Indiana before. Michigan played against them, and obviously he played for the Wolverines at the end of his college career as well. So I think Barner could be a guy late on day three. He's not going to go earlier than that because he doesn't have a ton of athletic upside. He hasn't done much as a receiver. I don't see that being an area he's going to make a significant impact in the NFL, but his blocking ability is going to add a lot of value and give him a chance to play some significant snaps early for the Seahawks or another team. As always, you can follow me on X and Threads at Corbett Smith NFL. Make sure to subscribe to Locked on Seahawks on YouTube and wherever you get your podcast to make sure you don't miss a single episode. We're going to have our final mock draft Monday of the 2024 offseason coming your way on Monday. Nick Lee, Rob Rang, and I will all dish out our final mock draft, seven-round mock drafts, and we'll be diving into those. Make sure to listen in. Enjoy your weekend. Go Hawks.